Okay, I'm gonna start. Okay. So hi, welcome to this podcast. Uh, today we have a very special guest. We have theoretical quantum physicist Johannes Schackenmayer. Uh, Johannes Schackenmayer is a researcher at the University of Strasbourg at the European Center for Quantum Science. Uh, he's also my advisor. Uh, he does research in topics such as quantum many simulation. Uh, he does topics in cold atoms, uh, cavities, stuff, uh, but mostly quantum many physics. So that's mostly what this uh, episode is going to be about. So yes, hi, welcome. How are you? Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Doing great. Okay, good. Uh, so let's start. Okay, so a lot of this episode is about quantum many body physics, but for example, for people who never don't know much about quantum physics, or maybe they're not physicists, basically, uh, what will be your best explanation about what quantum physics is, or what makes it fundamentally different than classical mechanics? Quantum mechanics or quantum many body mechanics? <laughs> Uh, we can start simple. So let's start simple. Uh, quantum physics. Uh, what makes it fundamentally different than classical physics or non-quantum physics, so to say it? Or what's your explanation? Well, the fundamental difference is just that uh, it's uh, the laws of physics that hold when you go really to the microscopic world, right? So if you go to the to the atomic level, uh, the laws of classical physics they just don't apply anymore, and uh, you have different laws of quantum mechanics reigning that type of uh, type of microscopic uh, field, yeah. Okay, uh, okay, for example, but I mean, I don't know, for example, uh, you say that there are different laws, but like, what would you say that uh, the laws, uh, the main law for the main characteristics that you will say, for, you know, for someone that doesn't know about quantum physics, like, could you give an example or something to explain to someone what makes it fundamentally different than classical physics? Yeah, so I guess the, the really the biggest fundamental difference well, I would say is that uh, you have the features such as, for example, superpositions. Right? It's just uh, saying essentially that uh, a system can exist in two different states at the same time. And it just can exist at this microscopic level because at this microscopic scale there is, for example, no other system observing that system for a while. So you can have the superpositions and really, therefore, if another system comes in and observes your system, then the wave function collapses to a certain state. And that's kind of what makes a macroscopic system a classical system, because in a macroscopic world, there's always another system observing this system. Mm -hmm. And therefore, these features like uh, this superposition uh, just goes away and doesn't exist anymore. Okay, maybe just to make it clear, because I mean, sometimes when you watch like quantum physics documentaries or stuff like that, sometimes they explain to you, oh no, so the particles is in two parts at once. And it's not exactly like that, right? Or will you say yes? Um, no, it's just it's a uh, it's that's where it often then goes uh, in the philosophical direction. Uh, it's essentially just not clearly defined. I mean, the the physical object that exists at this situation is like a wave function, which, for example, associates a certain probability amplitude to be a system for a system to be in one state or the other state. But it's just uh, the system is described by this, and if you observe it, then it has a random collapse of this wave function. Uh, okay, okay. So. okay, yes, I, I hate to use this example, but I guess like one classical example is a uh, Schrodinger's cat, like at the boxing. Yes, yeah, yeah. exactly. That's, uh, that's the prime example where in reality, of course, this would not happen because you have a macroscopic system and it's really extremely difficult to isolate this cat completely from the environment. But if you could do this, then of course you could have the superposition. But on the other hand, in a microscopic world, if you have a single atom flying around, uh, then on the microscopic world, these effects of these type of uh, superpositions plays, start to play a role. Okay, and also maybe just to clarify, because I mean, the truth is like on the internet you find a lot of uh, basically bullshit, like you find that, I don't know, for example, that uh, your conscious, your human unconscious may, may change the world by seeing it. It's not really like that, I mean, it's not like, it's not that a human has to observe the atom no. or whatever to collapse. It's more about an interaction with the environment, right? Yes. What provokes the collapse. I think the famous philosophical example is also like the moon or so. The, the moon does not exist if nobody observes the moon. But of course, uh, there are so many observers around that uh, it's a microscopic system. So all these questions are not relevant in the macroscopic world, I would say. Yeah, so despite what uh, Deprak Chopra or all these new age guys told I mean, it's not really about human consciousness or the power of the <laughs> mind. That makes, okay, I just say, uh, there it's are people who doing, believe this, but there are yeah, a lot of people course. who believe so I just want but to But I think clarify. it's about, uh, you know, finding different laws so that you can predict uh, experiments in atomic spectra, for example. You can find corrections to energy shifts in levels, and that's how you can test these theories. Okay, so even at the first, you when I ask you about explaining quantum physics, you mentioned uh, 
uh, quantum physics or quantum many body physics. So yes. this uh, speaks about that you see a remarkable difference between quantum physics or quantum many body physics. So maybe if you could uh, explain a bit further. Yeah, as for me then the, the the main the main next effect that goes really from normal or from single particle quantum physics to many body physics is then really I would say entanglement, the feature of entanglement, where you now have uh, can have superpositions of uh, particles which are in two different states and they have been in a state where uh, depending on the state of the one system, the other system is going to be in the opposite state, and then you just uh, separate those two particles far from each other. Uh, and then, however, they remain in the superposition state. And then this is sort of uh, this kind of what Einstein called this bookie uh, action at a distance type of effect. And I think that's the key feature that really defines quantum many-body physics, because it's the key feature where first you have this exotic behavior showing up in a system with just two constituents, essentially. Okay. And then, of course, this generalizes to larger systems. Okay. Yes, and, and I mean it. Yeah. It seems. I mean it's clearly very important. I mean I think the, the last Nobel Prize was a bit related to the experimental confirmation of a uh, quantum entanglement between particles. Yeah. So it's yeah. it's actually really something that has been say, experimentally demonstrated. Yeah. Uh, okay. So yeah, it seems like entanglement. It seems like one of the let's say one of the key properties of quantum physics and something that, that I don't think that has a really exact analogous in classical physics. It seems no. like something truly quantum. The 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 comparison now is uh, like there is um, one can make this. Uh, kind of classical entanglement like imagine you know I have uh, like a, a blue paper and a red paper mm. and I put one in an envelope and I send it to you and you don't open this envelope uh, you know then uh, so at that point I have one envelope with a color mm. and you have an envelope with a color but I don't know the color but as soon as I open mine I know what color yours is mm -hmm. right but this is not entanglement right? entanglement is, is even more than that because entanglement even says that essentially uh, it could be both ways before, like yours could be blue or mine could be blue. Uh, and you'd really, it's not defined before it is open and exactly only in that point when you open it, it's going to decide. Okay, so yeah. Right, so this is always an, uh, an analog I, 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 I like to, you know, make to compare sort of classical correlation with really a quantum correlation. Yes, because I mean sometimes they also use this like a right sock, a left sock, but I mean in, it, it will not be exactly that in the sense that from the very beginning the right sock and the left yeah. sock are defined, but in quantum you'll be like before you don't search, you, it's not really defined from the beginning which one you're going to observe, but once you observe yours, exactly, uh, mine but, will be defined. But it says if I repeat the same experiment sort of many times with the same, same pair, like one time you get you have the blue one, I have the red one, and but it could also be the other way uh, in the same, 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 same setup. It's really only decided at the point when you open it. Okay. And that's the essence of uh, of this uh, bell pair uh, okay. entanglement. Okay, I see. And it's actually very cool that, in fact, I mean, entanglement to this day is still a research topic. It's something that we're still trying to understand the context of quantum many body physics. So, I mean, it's still, it's very fascinating, but at the same time, there's still uh, so much to learn to fully understand, especially in the context of quantum many body physics. Yeah. Yes, and I mean, also uh, because uh, the interesting thing is that it's really a sort of entanglement that can be a resource for all these quantum technology applications that people. Uh, talk about now so it can be something that can be really used uh, in the future. Okay, I see. And of course, uh, one of your research topics is about uh, quantum many body simulation. Uh, before we go uh, into that, uh, maybe first explain, uh, because I mean, a lot of your work is to uh, just make simulations of quantum many body systems, but I mean, and of course, in certain situations, it becomes very hard. In certain situations, you cannot just simulate quantum uh, as much uh, atoms or quantum uh, system as you want. There's, uh, this is difficult. So maybe if you could explain what makes it difficult to simulate quantum many body systems, why can I just do this in my normal computer? Because I mean, right now there's a lot of talk about this uh, quantum computation thing. So I mean, why couldn't I just not do this in a normal computer? What's the difficulty? Uh, yeah, it's a very uh, complex question. It looks it looks simple in the beginning. So what makes it uh, just fundamentally difficult in the beginning, and that's usually the first argument, is, is this what's called the exponential growth of the Hilbert space. So uh, what does one mean by that? I mean, if I have, for example, let's take the simplest quantum system that we can think about, it's a qubit. So it's a system where you can have states 0 and 1. Let's say it's called, let's call this one, one particle, if you like. And uh, then, of course, I have uh, to describe a state on this. I need to describe it with these two probability amplitudes for zero and for, for one. 
And now if I want to generalize this to larger n systems, so uh, if I take, for example, a system of two qubits, then I have to consider sort of all possible combinations uh, of, uh, of uh, basis states of these two qubits. So then I can have combination 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And they all can happen at the same time. So I have to take, keep track of four probability amplitudes. Now, if I, uh, if I add one more, then I already have to take care about eight uh, and then one more, then it's 16 and uh, 32. And so you can see that this immediately grows exponentially. So the number of probability amplitudes that I need to des describe a particular state increases exponentially with the number of, of qubits uh, that, that I have. And then, of course, it just becomes uh, immediately impossible. There's this uh, comparison that, uh, that one always uses that if you would take, for example, 300 qubits, and you would think about the number of, uh, of uh, state amplitudes you would need to describe this uh, an arbitrary quantum states of the 300 qubits, then you would need uh, sort of a computer memory in terms of gigabytes that it's on the order of uh, atoms existing in the whole universe. So it's, it's clearly in that, in that sense impossible to build a classical computer that could even store as much information as it's in generally needed to describe an arbitrary uh, quantum state. Uh, and so that's the first argument where one thinks, okay, this is this exponential uh, scaling of the com complexity and therefore it's essentially impossible to really simulate this on a classical computer. But then on the other hand, this is not really fully true, this uh, argument, because this only holds when you say that you want to really describe an arbitrary quantum state. But then, of course, if you look around, again, if you look around in nature and look at many body systems, then they are very much classical systems, right? They're not exotic quantum states. So in the, on the other hand, if I make a many body system with many different uh, constituents, then typically if I look at some real dynamics that's happening in nature, it doesn't produce very exotic quantum states. So in that sense, uh, it's often not, not really necessary to simulate the full state vector of a many body system, but one can really restrict uh, sort of the Hilbert space that one looks at to a very small fraction. So in that sense, of course, one, one can very well simulate larger systems and then actually what I really like is, um, I may probably mention later, I work a lot with these so-called matrix product state methods. And uh, uh, there one can, for example, see that it's really the uh, entanglement and not the system size, which is a crucial resource uh, for, 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 for quantum simulation, if you like. So what I mean by that is it's not, it's not really the size of the system that makes the calculation difficult, but it's, for example, the amount of entanglement that occurs in some in some evolution of a system that makes uh, that is connected to the difficulty of simulating it classically so and, and that's what i like very much about um, about this attempt of classically simulating a quantum system because uh, it kind of really makes you think about <laughs> mm. what's what's really the computational power of some some evolution in a quantum system Okay, yes. Uh, and yeah, I mean, you mentioned matrix products, which is something that you do a lot and is one of the main topics of research. Uh, yes, I, I mean, you mentioned it in something that I find very curious that I don't think I ever seen like a popular science article about matrix product states. It doesn't seem like it doesn't gather as much attention as, I don't know, some other uh, more uh, topics that, I, I don't know, quantum internet yeah. or something like that. And yeah. what I find a bit surprised because this thing actually works. Like, I mean, this thing is like, it's actually surprising how good it works. So uh, maybe if you could uh, explain further what matrix product state is. Uh, well, there's... Um I guess that's why there's no popular it's, science articles because yeah, I mean, yeah. in a way, it's very mathematical. It's, like, yeah, now, also, now I understand why there's uh, no popular science articles. Yes, I usually also also have sort of a way of explaining it with formulas, but I like to think about it as a generalization of a product state because it's a matrix product state, and uh, a product state. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure to what extent. I mean, so a product state is kind of a classical state of a many-body system. If you don't have any entanglement in the system, you can describe it by a so-called product state which if you think about, so if you have your one qubit here and your one qubit there, and if you have now states which I can describe as a product of the state of this qubit and the state of the other qubit, then that's kind of a classical state because there's no strange entanglement correlations between those, those two. Mm. And now what a matrix product state is, it's a sort of a state uh, which is an extension of a product state uh, to other states that allow for some finite but small quantum correlation between those particles. And uh, depending on the, the size of this matrix product state, so 
for the experts what you do is instead of writing it as like a product of this and a product of that, you write it as a matrix product. So meaning you write states as elements of a matrix and then you multiply these matrices. And then the size of these matrices, which is also called the bond dimension, essentially tells you of how much of these quantum correlations, how much of this entanglement you're allowed to keep between your constituents. And so you have this controllable knob in your classical simulation, how big you, ma you make these matrices, the more of these weird entanglement features you can actually keep. Okay. And uh, so it's this controllable knob of how much entanglement do I allow in my dynamics, uh, how much of these exotic quantum effects do I allow, and then I can, can simulate it. Okay. And now if, if I want to simulate some dynamics that does not need a lot of this exotic quantum correlation, then my simulation is going to be exact. Okay, yes. Yeah, but I, if I was in your position and I have to explain for a general audience, it is a bit hard to explain because, I mean, in a way, yeah, I mean, uh, physics at the end of the day is mathematics, so a lot of it is theoretical physics is a lot of mathematics, so, I mean, if you want to really understand it, you have to go to the mathematics. But, I mean, yeah. uh, just to have a general idea is that this is my mathematical or computational method to simulate quantum many-body systems, and yes. depending how effective it is, this depends a lot on the entanglement of the system. So, if there's low yes. entanglement, uh, this method is going to work uh, quite well and if there's a lot of entanglement maybe not so well but I guess the good news is uh, as you mentioned is that uh, especially in open quantum systems or in nature so to say like normally because of the environment sometimes they or in a lot of cases this entanglement is going to get destroyed so for open quantum systems uh, in particular I would say this matrix product stage techniques uh, works quite well. Yes and uh, I think also what I really like about it and one way one could also introduce it it's really um, it's also really a test and for some some quantum computation because uh, the goal that, that also here at this institute that we really have is to build sort of a quantum computer that can sort of create all of these exotic superpositions of many particles and uh, use this as, uh, as a resource to simulate some interesting physics or to solve some interesting problems um, but uh, these MPS, these matrix processing methods, they really are a practical tool to really benchmark, <laughs> benchmark things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, they, if you build a quantum computer, then it would be able, it would have to be able to capture more entanglement that I am able to capture with this classical method. So mm -hmm. that's what I also like about it. It's kind of a, um, yeah, it's like build your own little quantum computer and see how much, uh, how far you can go. Okay, I see. And I mean, uh, I don't know fully well the story, but I guess the method, it's uh, at the big, it, uh, it was uh, invented uh, at the beginning of the millennium, I would say, or middle 2000s, or I don't know exactly more or less. Uh, it goes, well, fundamentally, it goes back even earlier. It uh, goes back to the 1990s. Okay. Uh, back then it was, uh, it, well, it was, these things were developed or usually these things are developed independently in different communities. Mm -hmm. And it started sort of with this density matrix renormalization group algorithm. Uh, Stephen White, this was in the 90s, I think. Okay. Uh, I don't know, I forgot the exact year. And uh, it was essentially a way to compute ground states of many body systems mm -hmm. uh, really precisely. And, uh, and, and this, uh, this algorithm essentially did something similar as this matrix product state idea, but it just was not called matrix product state at, the, okay. at this point. And then it was sort of in the beginning of the 2000s when uh, people from more quantum information background, they actually uh, realized that one can reformulate these this DMRG algorithms also in terms of these matrix product states. And, uh, okay, and then the theory was also generalized to higher dimensions and because MPS is usually working for one dimensional systems. Yeah, that's true. And um, yeah, and okay, a lot okay. of research on this. Thing. Yeah, I see. And I mean, I mean, yes, you say that, yes, it has some caveats, like for example, it works better in one dimension, but I mean, even then so far, it seems like uh, the best technique available right now for simulating quantum systems. Uh, do you think like uh, in a way this is it or like do you think like it's possible to something uh, comes up that is actually will be better than matrix product states or and I know it's hard to really know but like I don't know maybe you have a guess or yeah um, well there I mean there are several other ways to simulate things and I mean especially it has drawbacks for uh, higher dimensional systems mm -hmm. um, I mean in higher dimensional systems it's there are generalizations of this matrix product states to higher dimensions but they're usually uh, you know very uh, they have very high numerical complexity so in practice they are 
they're sometimes difficult to apply. So they have, for example, the alternative methods like variational Monte Carlo mm. uh, algorithms, where one makes an ansatz wave function, and then one simulates uh, things variationally. So uh, I think there can be many methods, and it depends really on what you want to do with it. Okay. I think the main advantage of this MPS ansatz in the beginning is just that you have the whole wave function. Okay. You have uh, sort of the whole or at least an approximation of your wave function at every uh, point in time. But if you, if you're for example, not interested in this, and if you're only interested in how does a local observable evolve as a function of time, then there can be other methods too. Mm -hmm. There can be also semi-classical techniques uh, that have been very successful in simulating effective quantum dynamics only for an expectation value, how it, how it evolves in time. But the MPS, I think, is the best method that sort of keeps the whole state and uh, at least an approximation of the whole state, so which there's a lot of information yeah, yeah, of in, in a state, right? There's not yeah. only there's not only what's the probability for finding this qubit in that state and finding the other qubit in the other state. There's a all type of you know many multi multi qubit correlations uh, stored in a quantum state. So okay, I see. Yes, and and yes, I think they. Because I mean, also I uh, want to be careful always. Because I mean, the truth is like sometimes in, in popular science articles or stuff like that. Sometimes you do see a bit a bit of overhype or exaggeration. So I mean, I think it's important. I mean, I do find very cool all these things about quantum computing. But I mean, I think it's also. I mean, if one is realistic, one has to recognize that it's also a very difficult problem. And I mean, the, the reason that I say is because, for example, matrix product states in many situations, maybe in most situations, can compete uh, in even. Uh, uh, be, be, have a better performance than the current quantum computers. So maybe if you want to clarify for people who are interested and stuff. Um, yes. So, uh, I mean, what we've been talking about before, it's it's really that MPS always works well as long as you don't have much of this entanglement in your system. Now, uh, I said sort of if you have a large system, you usually uh, don't have much of this. So there's many different mechanisms that can limit this entanglement. Mm. There can, for example, be disorder in the system. Uh, that's that's one main thing, but the other big issues of course because you never really have a fully isolated system But you always have a system that's to some extent coupled to some environment and then you have noise processes And also especially these noise processes uh, they really strongly destroy entanglement in a quantum state make then on the one hand this MPS uh, simulations efficient uh, and on the other hand if you have a quantum computer with noise it makes this quantum computer less efficient because it's destroying this, uh, this entanglement. So one has to be realistic, I think. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, the theory of uh, quantum simulation and quantum computation has a very long history, mm -hmm. and it's, it's sort of proven to work. But uh, of course, you need sufficiently well-isolated quantum systems that can you know, simulate coherent dynamics sufficiently well, meaning with small enough couplings to the environment. And uh, at the moment, the current uh, quantum computing hardware that exists is just very noisy. Okay. It makes a lot of mistakes. And all of this, this, this noise is destroying this entanglement, is destroying this, what you would want to, uh, to have. So we are not there yet that the quantum computers nowadays are really useful for solving any, any real world problem. And it's the main challenge at the moment to okay. get there. Uh, okay, I see. On the experimental side. Huh? Okay, and, and you briefly mentioned, but I don't know if, if actually you can speak about it because you mentioned, I mean, here in, in Strasbourg you have this access project, uh, but I don't know about this quantum computer, but I don't know if, if you're allowed to talk about it or if you want to share it and, in a way. Oh, the access, yeah, the, yeah. the access is a, is, a, is a project where here uh, we want to build a quantum computing mm -hmm. platform that's openly accessible, mm -hmm. so a public platform that then other researchers can use. Okay. And uh, it's based on an atomic. Uh, atomic uh, uh, qubit architecture with using Rydberg atoms okay. as, uh, as interactions between the qubits. Okay, I see. Okay, but I mean, this project, I mean, uh, I don't know, because you're much more involved, so I don't know, uh, so how's it going? I mean, well, I'm I mean, not building, I'm not involved <laughs> in the sense Shen, that I do a theory, but Shannon Whitlock is... Uh, uh, okay, okay, is okay really but you're coming from the theory side, I think. I yes, just, yeah, yeah. Okay, yes. cool, okay. Um, okay, good, uh, okay, yes, um, like I said, um, and also, yes, I just want to clarify, well, I mean, we say it already, but uh, I just want to clarify that, 
uh, at least as a PhD student, sometimes it happens that sometimes you don't know how much you don't know in a way. For example, in the sense when you start like a bachelor uh, degree in physics, you have a quantum physics course, uh, and maybe you're not fully aware how really simple and how basic it is because you really yeah, see yeah, at the yeah. most basic examples like hydrogen atom, one atom, no noise, only one particle. But like, I mean, uh, I just want to clarify what um, that yes, it's very interesting, it's very fascinating, but at the same time, like, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that. that that I don't know, and maybe that no one knows right now, because I mean, in quantum many body physics, especially, I will say there's still a lot. I mean, yeah, there's still a lot of research. There's still uh, things that we don't understand. That is still like, like yes, yes, yes. I mean, it's it, this is. I mean, as a researcher, right, you should be at the at the at the point with like the state of the art. So there's you are, one is exactly at the point, you know, where new things need to be found. Otherwise, you're doing engineering, right? Mm. So, <laughs> That's kind of, I think, the definition of doing research that you do stuff that is really not not known. Okay, and for I don't know from your perspective, what would you say that are especially in open quantum in quantum many body systems? What would you say like the biggest like uh, current problems or I would say like what are the, say, the situations that where you think like we are uh, we're more far we're farther from a, a deep understanding? Like, is there some particular from your perspective like some particular problem where you think like we are still like because I don't know. For example, if I talk about I don't know cosmology or stuff, I could say like dark dark matter and dark energy, these are like very big problems yes. that we're still very far. Do you think there's something equivalent in quantum physics or not, not necessarily that far, but like do you think yeah. like... So I, I think in, in quantum many body physics there's something fundamental different from sort of the more, how should I say, the more um, full theoretical physics. I mean, you, you mentioned things like the dark matter or... Mm-hmm. Uh, or uh, really the the forefront where at uh, this this high high energy physics field, mm-hmm. there's really the question of really finding new laws of physics okay. and trying to f- try to find out, you know, what happens really on uh, larger energy scales that we have not explored yet. Are there any type of new forces coming out, and then trying theoretically to describe that in a in a theory. And uh, that's really not what one does in quantum anybody physics or. Uh, or many body physics in, in general here. Here it's more like that uh, the fundamental laws are known, or at least one makes an assumption, and one knows very well that uh, the atoms or the atomic qubits behave like like they do, so the laws of quantum mechanics, and if you go a bit deeper, quantum field theory, they are very well tested, very well known. But now we are making many body phys- systems, mm-hmm. we're making huge, huge, uh, uh, huge systems with many, many different uh, constituents. And now from this uh, huge complexity, this, you know, in principle, you have this exponentially growing Hilbert space, so there can be a lot of physics happening mm-hmm. just from the interaction of these many body particles. So it's a kind of an emergent phenomenon study. But even there, I mean, we have many things, even uh, real physical effects. I mean, the prime example is high temperature superconductivity, uh, which is the fact that some materials, if you cool them down below a certain temperature, they start to lose any type of electrical resistance. And this is the prime example of an effect that somehow comes from the it's a quantum effect coming from the interaction between these particles in, in the material. And there's really partially there are some materials where really nobody understands nowadays mm. at least fully what's going on and how this, how this works. So uh, what we do in our field is we try to understand these many body effects that come from the emergent complexity of a system with many different particles all, all together. Okay. And understanding these macroscopic effects or finding ways of uh, using them uh, to make macroscopic quantum materials to some extent, that's, uh, I think that's one really outstanding challenge. Okay, there. cool. So yeah, I think in a way in quantum anybody physics, like we basically, we take the rules from quantum mechanics, so to say, is like the rules that we know that experimentally they're demonstrated, they work, but I, and knowing these rules, we try to extend it instead of having like the most basic example, like hydrogen atom or whatever, we try to extend, okay, what happens yeah. if we have many, many, body, many atoms or whatever, what happens yeah. if we have noise and we, I guess, we try to explore yeah. more a bit more. I mean, this it also issue. happens in, uh, in uh, not only in quantum mm-hmm. physics, also classical physics, right, if you look at... Uh, you want to want to understand some microscopic chaotic effects, <laughs> the yeah. weather, for example, right? That that's kind of I think similar with classical physics, and you have a many-body nonlinear classical system. It's very difficult to understand, and the same we do with uh, quantum systems. Yeah. No, yeah, I guess it makes sense. I mean, not because you know, I don't know. For example, uh, I mean. 
for example, I don't know, you can know general relativity, but that doesn't mean that you can know exactly the physics of an airplane, for example. So in a say, what I'm trying to say is that you can know classical mechanics or like the basics of quantum mecha- the classical mechanics, but that doesn't mean that you will not necessarily know how every classical mechanic system works. Yeah, so in no, a way, because like, a many body system is very difficult mm, to solve, yeah, and there are a lot of effects that come from the interactions between many many particles, and they're not easy to understand, and there can mm. be really new effects that nobody uh, nobody knows yet. Okay, I see. Okay, and and I know it's not a not maybe not directly related uh, to your research, but I I have asked the question to many well not many but a few uh, quantum physicists and sometimes they try to avoid it or they a bit they don't seem to sometimes I see I have they don't seem to care that much but like for example when you go to Wikipedia and quantum physics there's also gonna be a little section philosophical implications of quantum physics eh, or the problem mm-hmm. of measurement and stuff like that. Uh, I don't know, do you have a strong opinions about that or why do you think that uh, most people are a bit hesitant to say that, I don't know, to opinionate about this? Um, I don't know. I personally, I never had any philosophical issue with, really? <laughs> with quantum mechanics. Okay. No, because it's just, uh, I actually found it rather natural for me. I mean, it's... I, You know, this goes back to this Albert Einstein, this exactly this bell bell measurement discussion. It's about you know what's uh, what's the reality. I mean, what uh, do does a system independently exist, fully determined or not, mm-hmm. until the point that some other system comes in and measures it? But yeah, I mean, I had occasional things uh, to think about this, especially when I was learn, learning first quantum mechanics. Mm-hmm. But honestly, I, I never really fully understood why it's such a big deal I mean I personally don't have, have an issue with the fact that that uh, a system can exist in two different states and it's completely not determined and only by being observed it starts to become kind of real and okay. I think this kind of makes sense honestly okay but I don't know for example do you think it's like I mean do you think it gradually becomes clear or is it like one point is not real and one point like for example how exactly a collapse happens like is this, is this something that it's on, I don't know for you is it under, do you think it's understood or like or is it more like a postulate in a sense that like well I think it's kind of uh, the, the question is if you are if you are fine with the fact that it's something that cannot be fully understood or not But I think if there's like an isolated system that exists completely outside of any interaction with anything else, it kind of, does it exist? Is it real? Does it have fixed parameters before you measure it or not? I think that's the essence of this, this question. Okay. And I think so some, some people have some, some problem with the fact that you cannot find a fundamental law which you can pre-calculate in which state the system is going to collapse okay. if you measure it. And... Uh, I think it's beautiful. I think it's beautiful to have this definition of something is not real unless something else measures it. Okay, I see. But uh, again, in the end, I think it's. Uh, um, I think in like science, it's just the la- experiment always the last uh, decisive yeah, the factor. Right. So it's, mm. you have to, you know, if you want to come up with a new theory that describes sort of that precalculates with some hidden variables. A state that your system is going to collapse in, then you have to. Then your job is to find out an experiment that then can distinguish the theory from quantum mechanics as it exists now, mm-hmm. and then do this experiment and then show that your theory is working, the other one not. But okay, I see. Okay, yes, so I if somebody see. comes along and, and does something like this, then then yeah. But I mean, the <laughs> bell measurement kind of showed that it's uh, it's not really possible unless you give up things like special relativity. Mm, I see. So. Okay, I see, I see. But I mean, I don't have any philosophical. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I was just curious. No, because I mean, for some people, it really is a big issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not like it no. I mean, it's it's ongoing research. If you go to the March meetings in the US, mm. there's always a, a, a session only on fundamentals of uh, mm. physics, and people, many people, are still not happy and develop new theories. Yeah, yeah. Well, and also I'm a bit like, skept- skeptic about how much progress can you actually make just by uh, debating say, because I think unless you do an experiment you just debate and debate but like and, 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 I don't know it becomes a matter like yeah. yeah I mean I wouldn't exclude that somebody comes up with a theory that can be experimentally <laughs> like the bell measurements was it's a beautiful example of yeah. uh, coming up with an experiment to distinguish different uh, different aspects of the theory. Yeah, um, I, I know it's a, maybe a bit tricky to explain to a general audience, but maybe just a, in a very general way, if you could explain what are the bell inequalities or stuff like that. Yeah, um, yeah well, it's exactly this, what we talked about earlier, this uh, classical versus quantum correlation. Uh, right, if I, you had, uh, 
the blue paper, I had the red paper. Mm -hmm. Uh, sort of there's this way of having this like, classical correlation that in the sense that I do it secretly I give it to you and mm -hmm. you don't know about it but then there's also the quantum way that we share a quantum state of this the red paper and the blue paper and I have the blue paper and the, the red paper and every time I have the blue paper you have the red paper mm -hmm. and, but we have a quantum state meaning that those two possibilities exist at the same time okay. and uh, this exactly uh, this Bell measurement is exactly this, sort of, you prepare a quantum state, which is in such a superposition, uh, it's called a Bell, Bell state, and then you uh, move these far away from each other in such a way that you can exclude that there's any classical uh, communication between the two, meaning, you know, there's a, you know, it's a speed of light argument, so <laughs> we have to be far enough that on the, the time scale we do the experiment, we cannot communicate. And then one just does a random measurement in a, in a different basis. Mm -hmm. It's now difficult to explain with red and blue. <laughs> <I understand. laughs> mm -hmm. But in the end, it's like uh, one just does the measurement in the basis uh, that one in the beginning doesn't tell to the other guy. And then you measure in this basis and then you find something. And then it's kind of like afterwards you compare your measurement outcomes and then you see that, that your measurement outcomes are really correlated in such a way that it can only be described with the law of this entangled superposition, so only with quantum mechanics and not with another classical uh, theory that only includes classical correlation between okay. the two systems. Okay, so yes, I guess um, maybe it's very hard, but it is possible in some cases to make like progress in fundamental uh, quantum physics, uh, and I guess this is an example in the yes. sense that they've, yeah, build uh, this, this researcher find, find a way to like mathematically kind of may find like a significant difference between the quantum and the classical world and we was experiment yes. last year i mean last year they got a Nobel prize about this yeah. uh, some scientists that uh, were able to yes okay uh, uh, maybe just um, just to finish, uh, I know one of the, your other areas of research that I actually I don't know that much is uh, a lot of you of stuff that you have done also has to do with cavities and molecules. So I don't know if you would like to explain a bit that about uh, that side of your research. Um, uh, yeah, that's that's uh, quite different type of research. So that's really uh, something that's very uh, has come up here in Strasbourg, mm -hmm. in the, particular in the group of Thomas Evison. He has been a pioneer in this field. And that uh, was doing type of new type of experiments with uh, chemical reactions, mm -hmm. uh, where essentially one, one could see that one can change chemical reactivity if one uh, strongly couples molecules to cavities. Okay. So a cavity is essentially a mirror here, a mirror there. That's the <laughs> most naive way that you can think about. So it's essentially uh, like a photonic mode. Mm. So you know, one defines by boundary conditions the wavelengths of a photonic mode, and then uh, sort of a f one can now couple this photon really to some either electronic transition in the molecule or some vibrational transition in the molecule, and one can make this coupling very strong. So what does it mean, strong coupling? It means if imagine you have uh, now, let's take you have again a two-level system, you have a ground state, you have an excited state. And now imagine this two-level system is in this, what I call, it's called the optical cavity, so it can exchange the energy with some of these uh, photonic modes. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's say that the coupling, so sort of the excited state can go from the upper level to the lower level by emitting a photon, but then the, the photon is essentially, it, uh, you know, it cannot escape, it's like trapped next to this two-level system, so it can be reabsorbed again. Mm -hmm. So what then happens is that the whole system, you have to really describe it as a coupled system, of this two-level system and the cavity. You really cannot say you have the two-level system and this cavity mode, okay. but the, the system that you have is really the coupled system, right? okay. so because it has new states, new eigenstates in the system, which are so-called polaritonic states. And uh, yes, and, and, and this is what strong coupling is. And what they found here is that if you do this thing with molecules and you look at, for example, chemical reactions, you see that you can change chemical reactions in that way. Um, yes. Not only chemical reactions, there have also been experiments of uh, transport properties in material like conductivities. And there have been experimental evidence that you can change uh, uh, okay. change materials, uh, properties of materials and chemical reactions by engineering such strong coupling situations. Okay. And it's kind of a cool research uh, field because it really combines uh, quantum optics mm. objects like cavity QED uh, together with some chemical systems. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's, it's, 
it's a very exciting field in the sense that this is one example where a lot of experimental observations are really not understood theoretically nowadays because chemical systems can be very complex and there's a lot of theory effort nowadays to really just mm. explain experimental observations in this field. Yeah, to be honest, like the first time that you have, a, I don't know, of course in quantum optics, you see a cavity. In a way, it seems like too idealized. Uh, it seems, oh, okay, does this actually exist? But I mean, yes, yeah. I mean, there have been experiments by Serge Haroche, I think, like, I mean, these experiments yeah. where they were able to, thanks to uh, manipulating cavities, in, in some ways they were able to, like, manipulate uh, individual quantum systems, for example. So, I mean, yeah, these things actually exist. And I mean, these systems, like, uh, yes, I guess uh, one of the, I mean, the reason that they use it is because it kind of gives you the possibility of doing some physics that otherwise in other experimental settings it will not be possible or it will be very hard, I guess. Yes. Okay. But now it's exciting to apply this to some chemical reactions. <laughs> okay. I think it's a very, very cool, cool field. Okay, cool. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, but, yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, You're yeah, welcome. Good. Okay, right. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, is this okay? Yes. Yeah, that's uh, good. Okay. Very nice.